Can I introduce myself, Martin Wilkes. I'm an ecologist. I've been at CORE since near, nearly the beginning, November 2014. So I know many of you quite well. I'd like to get to know more of you better. And it's an opportunity today for you to get to know me. I'm putting myself really on the line today. I'm opening myself right up to you. I'm talking about my personal history, um, which colours this word resilience. So I've made this montage of some of the images I've used in, in the presentation. But if you've come here today expecting me to answer this question definitively, then you're going to need to be quite resilient yourselves. You're going to be disappointed. Um, but I've called it, what on earth do you mean resilient ecosystems? And it's a perspective from my work, which is really about large scale biodiversity trends. Just some acknowledgements before we carry on. Um, my close collaborator at Leeds, Lee Brown, is a polar biologist. Also Sandy Milner at Birmingham, my mentor since my master's there. Um, Mo, who's been doing fantastic work for the last three years or so. And I'll talk a little bit about her project as we go along. And Marco, uh, my boss here, but also um, some, a really good sounding board for ideas around resilience and systems in general. So what am I going to talk about today? Actually, I'm going to sit down because I've got a bad back, if you don't mind. <coughs> uh, we're going to do some audience participation, first of all. Don't be too scared. It's quite easy. I do most of the work. Then we're going to talk about positionality, which is quite unusual for an ecologist or, or for I don't know, an environmental scientist in general. I'm going to spend some time talking about my personal history and co our collective history and how that makes me think about this question of resilient ecosystems. Then I've kind of conceptualised resilience around some of the things that we do here at CORE, and I've called it a window on resilience, and I'll explain a bit more why later on. I'm going to use that window to look at some examples from my recent work, and then come up with some sort of synthesis at the end, but this will not be definitive. We're entering a learning zone now, which is a safe zone for us all to make mistakes, make fools of ourselves, get things wrong, and that's equally for me as it is for you. Um, I'm really out of my comfort zone here, so it's nice to know that we've got friendly faces. As we move into the audience participation part, I need at least two volunteers to name one of your favourite species that occurs in Great Britain. You've made it just in time, because I, I, pr I prepped Barbara to bring the species with her. <laughs> Go on then. Steve? Yeah, in the news, very topical, um, Little Rock is Corvus coronis, Perrin Joe. Uh, Corvus? Peroni. Yeah. Peroni like the beer? Uh, with an A on the end. Peroni. No, per Peroni. P-O. Coroni. Like a crown, yeah? Like that. Okay, great. Sheila? <laughs> the oyster catcher, okay. We'll have to look up the. Uh... It's okay, I can do it. So, uh, sorry, Barbara, you're not going to get the chance to do yours, but maybe we can do it later on. Or should we do three? Let's do three, come on. <laughs> Barbara. Do you want a plant? Yeah, let's have a plant. Okay, how about Pervo? Campanula tundiflora. Campanula <laughs> tundiflora. Rotundiflora. We need a Latin name for this. Okay, so what we're going to do first <coughs> is just check on those Latin names if the screen will behave. So it was Corvus Coroni. Corvus. Corvus. You can tell how good my Latin nomenclature is. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do is just search this model that I've prepared here, where we're going to go to something called the Global, Bio Global Biodiversity Information Facility that has over a trillion data points of species occurrences around the world. And we're just going to search for that species and see how many data points it's got in the database. So it's got 252,000 
Yeah, just over 252,000. So what we're going to do is just use the first 10,000 of those or, or else we'll, we'll, it won't be finished downloading by the end of the seminar. And next thing I'm going to ask you to do, Steve, is tell me where to place my finger on the map here where you think that species is most likely to occur in Great Britain, so just the main island. Happy there, yeah. Okay, I'm going to copy that, the coordinates. And then the next one, what's the oyster catcher? There's the scientific name. Uh, Eurasian, I guess we're talking about the Eurasian. So let's see, we've got 100,000 or so data points. So there's a massive amount of data for these species. And then finally, just in the UK, so the way I've done the model is just to search within the mainland, Great, Great Britain, yeah. Sheila? North, east, west. Which is the Isle of Skye? No, Round here. I, don't, I need to make sure I don't click on the sea because we can't search on the sea. There? Yes. Okay. Good. I've just shown you all how poor my geography and Latin is, right? And then, Barbara, sorry to keep my back to you. We're going to actually just search Campanula flora. So it's good to have a plant as well because we often see that um, plants have different responses to climate change and we, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to predict the effect of climate change on these species. Um, so we've got less there, 28,000, but still enough to, to go ahead. And Barbara, can you think where in Great Britain it might be most likely to occur? Something like that? Okay. So for all three of you, can you tell me what... Oops. Can you tell me what you think the effect of climate change will be? on these three species, positive or negative, on the, the likelihood of them occurring. Barbara? But at that point that you've selected, you think the probability is going to go up or down. Um, we're talking about two degree temperature rise, quite a crude representation of climate change, and also a 25% increase in precipitation variability. I think there's a probability it will actually boost its range because in the Highlands of Scotland and parts of Northern Ireland it's not very common. Yeah. It increases with the hoodie trail, so it may well actually expand further north. Do so you think the probability might go up? Yeah. yeah. Sheila? So we could say it's about, about the same if you wanted to, yeah? All right. So let's get those models running and we can get on with the real work of the seminar. What that's going to do is export a map for us and give us the results on the map and we'll come back to it at the end. Oh, we've got a problem with Corvus Coroni. But we'll come back to that because we're running out of time already. So... This is what we're going to do. We're modelling occurrence probabilities every square kilometre based on climate and soils. 
uh, we've predicted the location where you think the species is most likely to occur in Great Britain, and we've predicted the effect very generally for climate change. We'll come back to that at the end. But here's a bit more audience participation for you now. What do these pictures have in common? So ancient Africans migrating through the savannah, a council house in Wolverhampton, Diane Fossey, saviour of the mountain gorillas, blue-eyed ancient Middle Eastern people, the Bay Tapestry, and Charles Darwin. Any ideas? Well, they're all to do with me and, and how I see myself in the world and in our collective history. And I'll just expand upon that. Starting with our mother, the mother of all of us, um, the mitochondrial mother. We know that we're all related to this one woman who lived in what we would now call East Africa um, around 200,000 to 500,000 years ago. Because we, in all of our cells, in our body, we've got these mitochondria that are kind of the powerhouses of the cells. Without these, we couldn't function. And the mitochondria have their own genome separate from our genome in our cells. And we can use um, statistics to trace back the lineage. And the lineage is, funnily enough, traced back through the female side. Only females pass on <coughs> the mitochondrial uh, DNA. And we know with a high certainty, some uh, pub publication in Nature about five years ago, with high certainty that we're all related to this one woman who lived in East Africa. So I've only recently become aware of this, but where I grew up in Wolverhampton, the school that I went to, I was in the minority as a, as a white person, and especially as a white person with fair hair and blue eyes. So I always wondered where did blue eyes come from? And as soon as we got the internet in about 1997, 98, I looked this up and found that we had quite good evidence that blue eyes evolved in one family around the Fertile Crescent at the time of the Agricultural Revolution. So about six to 10,000 years ago. And of course, from there, humans populated the whole globe. My ancestors went west from the Middle East. And a recent uh, report in National Geographic uh, of a reconstruction of what, what we call the Cheddar Man. So this was a remains of a man found in the Cheddar Valley down in the southwest of England. And the reconstruction suggested that this man had dark skin and blue eyes, so he could have been one of my ancestors. And he lived around 6,000 years ago. We fast forward quite a long way now to the Norman conquest of England. And this is important in my story because the Normans named my family. They gave us my surname, Wilkes. Um, and we can trace our lineage back to this man who lived in uh, North Worcestershire, not so very far from where I live now, in 1530. Also, the story goes from my nan, who said, my grandmother, who said that she'd done our family tree, but no one's ever seen any evidence of it. So this is mostly based on her story. We'll fast forward another few hundred years now. And uh, during that time, you know, my family had been working um, in the farming landscape, often traveling around. So the story goes to find seasonal work, but about 200 years later, the, the landscape was industrializing and Constable painted the Hayway in um, early 19th century. And he intentionally avoided the horrors of industrialization of the landscape. But other people at the time, such as Oliver Goldsmith, writing in The Deserted Village based on what was happening in Suffolk, was more scathing. Sunk are thy bowers in shapeless ruin all, and the long grass o'ertops the mouldering wall, and trembling, shrinking from the spoiler's hand, far, far away thy children leave the land. Ill fares the land to hastening ills of prey, where wealth accumulates and men decay. So let's keep that in mind as we fast forward about 10 generations of my family on the male side, um, funnily enough, Johannes de Wilkes was anglicised directly to um, a man ten, ten generations later, John Wilkes, who married Sarah Massey, and they were both born in North Worcestershire, in that farming landscape. 
but their lives were bracketed by the Enclosure Act. This was driving people off, common people off the land, the less and less common land to use, and it was concentrating land ownership and wealth into the hands of fewer and fewer people. So at the beginning of the, the 19th century, the eve of the Industrial Revolution, they moved to the black country, and we were coal miners for the next 100 years or so. It's called the Black Country, and I'm talking about a place just to the northwest of Birmingham, the other side of Birmingham from where we are. It's called the Black Country because everything turned black during the Industrial Revolution. There's a famous case that Darwin was aware of. Darwin lived just down the road in Shropshire of the peppered moth. And this was a case of evolution that you could see happening in very, a very short time. So the peppered moth needs to camouflage itself against the silver birch tree, and it's typically this kind of colour. But within just a few generations, all the trees had gone black, and the moths had also turned black, and we now know that this was evolution rather than, for biologists in the room, phenotypic plasticity. This is real evolution in action. Okay, so we fast forward another few generations, and we can talk about my experiences growing up. <coughs> The symbol I've chosen for this slide is uh, the Icar Canned Beef Monument in Sarajevo. Might sound a bit obscure, but this is a kind of sarcastic tribute to the food aid that was received in Sarajevo by, uh, during the Bosnian War from the European Economic Community. And I ate the same beef when I was a child in the early 90s that my mum brought back from the food banks. It was disgusting. She tried to do things with it like spaghetti bolognese, lasagna, but it was just like dog food, really. Um, I couldn't find a house of where we lived. Nobody thought it was remarkable enough to take a photo of it. But I put a call out to friends and family, and we got a photograph of a house on the same estate where I lived, the Low Hill Estate in the north of Wolverhampton, and this is it. This was not an unusual picture uh, in the landscape for me growing up. I was also one of the generation that Maggie Thatcher, or so the story goes, took milk away from. And I was particularly annoyed at this because I was the milk monitor in primary school. So I would get out of lessons for half an hour every day to deliver the milk around the school until the late 80s when she took it away from us. A bit later on, during my early teens, I was introduced to alcohol, smoking, other drugs domestic violence but my saviour really and, and and this goes for a lot of my friends as well with the adventures that we had along the canal network as black country in birmingham this was kind of our uh, nature on our doorstep or so we so we thought of it uh, there was a mystery around every corner and we'd go fishing it was really our escape another escape for me was football playing for and supporting my local team and this is one of my heroes steve ball he scored something like 600 goals for us during the 80s and 90s. So these were th things that I really saw that saved me, that kept me active, that um, some sort of therapy. And much more lately, I've gone through a process that I call rebirth. Some people call it re rewilding, but um, I have to admit that I'm not um, totally au fait with the terminology here, but I think you get the idea. And that was really catalyzed by reading Rachel Carson's book, which I'm sure influenced many of us here. Uh, but also D Diane Fossey, and I got into Diane Fossey through the film with Sigourney Weaver. You know, Diane Fossey was somebody who really put her life on the line for conservation of mountain gorillas, and whatever we think about her methods, they were effective. And then I became, um, five or six years ago, became involved in um, performance art, where we've been rediscovering the value of, of ritual and the value of ritual in, in specific cases for uh, helping people with social anxiety, uh, violent histories, problems with intimacy, um, working with charities there. Okay, so that's my history and I'm trying to give you a background um, that will help you understand the approach I take to research, what I choose to research and what findings I choose to emphasise. And with this in mind, I've been talking to a lot of people recently at CORE, but also in the community, my family, basically anyone that will talk to me about resilience. 
And these are the kind of words, phrases that, that come back. So bouncing back, resilience as resisting change, resilience as building in vulnerability, resilience as a transformation, as adapting to change or coping. Or another idea is resilience as self-sufficiency and independence. And we'll, we'll come back to this idea in a moment. But I think my main message must be that for the word to be useful, we must define what kind of resilience we mean. Resilience of what? Of what system or of what property of, of the system? Resilience with respect to what? So what external change or, or pressure uh, is the thing being resilient to? And through what mechanisms is resilience occurring? We'll come back to this through the presentation. I just pulled out some examples of different um, areas of the literature and one of the obvious ones where resilience is relevant is in psychology. I've just done some classic kind of Google Scholar acad academic work where I've just put these search phrases into Google Scholar and I've linked here in case we wanted to follow them up to the publications that are most highly cited. So we could talk about resilience of individual well-being to workplace stress through personal coaching, and this is a real example, very uh, high impact paper in the literature in about 2005, and this is really about coping. In social studies, and I'm sad that Lopa's not here today because this is a link to her really nice piece in the conversation. We could talk about the resilience of deprived communities to austerity through social supermarkets. And actually, Lopa gave a very nice balanced uh, review of that in her piece in the, in the conversation. And that's really about building independence, self-sufficiency, and resilience as something transformational. In economics, we might talk about the resilience of low-income countries to financial so shocks through a business model known as self-insurance, where businesses are required to build up a reserve. And that's really about invulnerability. So you can see now that when we talk about a resilient ecosystem, we're being lazy because we're not really talking about what part of the ecosystem with respect to what what mechanisms and what kind of resilience we're talking about. We can move on to engineering. We're getting closer to the kind of things that I study now, um, but I've linked here to one of Sue's papers um, that actually was the first one to come up with this search. So looking at the flood resilience of urban areas to climate change through constructing sustainable drainage systems. That's about adapting. It's also about sort of building in vulnerability and um, through that process of construction is transforming the landscape and the functioning of the landscape. And then in ecology, which is really my area, um, I research, among other things, the resilience of fisheries to hydropower development through maintaining connectivity through the river in different ways. And that's, again, about adapting or even resisting change, resisting the, the, the development of river infrastructure. But I just wanted to add this final example because we, can't, we don't always assume in ecology that resilience is a good thing. It's more nuanced than that. We might talk about the resilience of invasive species, for example, to management intervention. So with that in mind, let's look at my window on resilience, which is not definitive or exhaustive at all. It's just my perspective, and that's kind of why I've represented it as a window, because we can all take a different perspective on that window. And the two axes here, first of all, the assumed positive or beneficial value of increased resilience, we go from a more sort of straightforward interpretation to a more nuanced interpretation. And then on the other axis, we've got the assumed implications of the research on resilience, from the less political or also may even assume apolitical to the, to the more explicitly political. And I've just put some areas of research that CORE uh, undertakes here. As I say, it's not exhaustive, but you know, we could easily have put environmental science here, climate science, etc. I've also put in neoliberal economics, and I'll show you why in a moment. So whilst engineering tends to have a more sort of straightforward view on resilience, increased resilience is better. If we build a dam, we want it to be resilient to, say, a 100-year flood, for example. In ecology, we might have a more nuanced interpretation of the value of resilience, as I've demonstrated with that example in the previous slide. As we move into political ecology, of course, the assumed implications of research are more political. I, mean, I, I really believe that the implications of 
any research can be political of anything in life, but we're talking about the assumed implications, assumed by the researchers. A neoliberal economics, I will argue, um, of course assumes that the implications of resilience are political, but in a quite sort of straightforward way that we need to enhance resilience. And, and we'll come back to some examples to help, help us understand that. Obviously, this is not something that, that Core values or, or, or works on directly. What we work on, really, I, I'm going to argue, are the tensions between neoliberalism and these areas of research and Core. We've got some examples in a moment. I just wanted to flash up. Uh, this window on resilience was inspired by some work we did at an All Core meeting. And, and Jahi and I mapped kind of what we wanted to map are the mothers and fathers of the ideas of resilience in these disciplines. It's all kind of rather depressing and one-dimensional, so we didn't, we didn't do that in the end. But I wanted to just explore some examples of these tensions between neoliberalism and some of the areas of research and core. So with regard to political ecology, um, and this is why I'm talking about be us being in a safe learning zone now, because when I talk about political ecology in front of people who are really serious academics in the area, I get nervous. But much of this is about community self-reliance. And Reid was really scathing in this paper in Development Dialogues. Um, I think the title was The Disastrous and Politically Debased Concept of Resilience. So really scathing. But Reid spoke of a political agenda that shifts the burden of security from states to people. I'm sure that's something we can relate to. The tension with ecology, I mean, there are many tensions, neoliberalism being kind of based on this kind of extractive ideology. But one of them is the idea of natural capital. And uh, I couldn't put it better myself than this paper in um, Capitalism, Nature, Society. The idea of natural capital is informed by the premise that nature's can only be saved, conserved, through their submission to capital. Okay, so we have to value in some monetary way the ecosystem. And then with engineering, we might talk about sustainable development. Um, we have to go back to 2005 for a really high impact uh, review on this. Um, that said that sustainable development will almost cert under neoliberalism will almost certainly promote a shallow green development agenda in which economic growth will be the central objective. So w this determines what kind of engineering structures are built, for whom. And I've worked in an area that sort of covers both ecology and engineering in, in a sub-discipline, kind of an interdisciplinary field called eco-hydraulics. I think the name speaks for itself. It's generally been focused on very kind of reductionist science of the relationship between fish and hydraulics around dams and other riverine infrastructure. But we've been arguing, and we did a paper, I did a paper with uh, some Malaysian colleagues at the last conference on eco-hydraulics, and this is what we've been arguing, that we need to, eco, people working in eco-hydraulics need to realise that they're intimately involved in this kind of neoliberal agenda in ways that have far-reaching consequences for people's well-being. So we're trying to bring that message to them and open up the field to this idea. Just to explore that in a bit more detail, now the first of two examples from my own work is hydropower development in South America. And this is really about the tension between neoliberalism and engineering and engineering and ecology. There's knock-on effect. So we go back to one of Maggie Thatcher's mates here, uh, General Pinochet, the dictator uh, of Chile for, for, for some decades during the 20th century. And in, uh, towards the end of his reign, he decided to sell off much of the water rights across Chile uh, very cheaply to companies from Europe and North America. Um, and what that has led to recently is that these companies want to leverage their investment, the investment that they made in the <coughs> late, late 80s and early 90s when the water rights were sold off. And, and many of them are proposing to do this by building huge dams in pristine environments in Patagonia, such as the Baker and Pasqua rivers, river, river valleys. And then a huge distribution network to take that power back up to the north, to Santiago, where more than half of the Chilean population live and all the way up to the Atacama to power uh, the mining industry. And that's despite the fact that in the Atacama, where they need most of the power, they also have the most 
sunlight hours per year of anywhere in the world and solar energy is far cheaper than hydropower per unit, uh, per unit uh, energy per kilowatt hour. So this doesn't make much sense. And actually there have been some successes in Chile in opposing hydropower development and these five huge dams were taken off the table because of the work of, of a group called Patagonia Without Dams. And actually this was a kind of middle class movement led by lawyers and their mates uh, and lots of fishermen, but nevertheless it had the desired effect. And it's not just limited to that part of Patagonia. This is a review back in 2015, a non-exhaustive review, but you can see how many dams are under construction and planned here. And essentially what they're doing in, in, in Chile, they've got about a thousand projects on the table at some part of, in some part of the planning process. They're going to build a wall between the Andes and the ocean and trap all of that water and sediment. And uh, some of the impacts of that are reviewed here in this really nasty uh, graphic. But there's one impact that I want to focus on, and that's um, the... Um, the, the blocking of fish migration and fish movement around rivers. And traditionally this has been approached through mitigation measures such as uh, fishways or fish ladders like this one that allow fish to get up beyond the dam and then some kind of engineering structures to let them back down again. Unfortunately, almost all of the work on how to design these structures has been based on fish from Europe and North America, the iconic Atlantic salmon, for example, whose uh, life cycle takes it from the ocean as an adult, back up into the rivers uh, to, to spawn, and then some growth for a year or two in the river and back to the ocean, and the cycle repeats. So dams can, of course, cut off the marine and freshwater habitat. One of the issues with this is that salmon are really an atypical species. I've just put these two pictures on here to scale. These are the kind of species we're often talking about in Chile. This is a galaxid fish, and this is a salmon that can get to you know, one, one metre long. And here I've just plotted from a recent paper we published in a special issue on the Anthropocene, the representative body length when these species are making their upstream migration and the maximum swimming speed they're able to attain. And you can see there's more or less a linear relationship there. So if, if we're designing structures for this fish, they're not going to work very well. For this fish and I'll just demonstrate now why that is. So these structures are extremely energetic environments. You can imagine if you're a tiny fish and the scale here is about two meters by two meters, you might find it quite difficult to get through there. So one of the ways um, in an EU project that I've been working on for the last four years that we've tried to tackle this is firstly improving engineering designs for native species through classic kind of hydraulic engineering and we've um, been uh, publishing and, and advising engineers and government agencies on how to uh, design these things with respect to fundamental hydraulic um, characteristics. I won't dwell on that but all this, all this shows is that over here we have the design standard for salmon but we need to be right down here to cater for the native species in South America. We've also been looking at how to design turbines better to minimise fish mortality, depending on the characteristics of the fish. But the other approach we've been taking is putting information into the hands of people that can oppose unsustainable hydropower development. And these are some models that we presented at the Fish Passage Conference last year, um, based on some observed processes in um, Minas Gerais, which uh, is uh, where a lot of my collaborators are working. And we show that the impact of a dam in the grey area here, in some different scenarios, always uh, affects the, um, the size of the fish population. And we've been wrapping this up into frameworks and we're now working on uh, web pages where people can um, plot the location of a proposed dam in their neighbourhood and get out the kind of species that might be affected by this and the level of um, impact that the dam might have on that fish population. So just to uh, summarise on that bit, there was a water sell-off in the 1980s and this led to unsustainable hydropower development. 
the approach to that, the engineering approach, has been to design these mitigation structures, but the designs are focused on salmon. And this has exacerbated, and something I didn't mention, existing problems in South America with invasions that are wiping out native species. This project, this EU project, Keep Fish, that we've been working on, has taken two approaches, better mitigation design for native species, but also better planning tools and data to, to support people opposing unsustainable development. I'll quickly move on then to the second of these tensions that I wanted to explore between neoliberalism and e ecology to look at climate change impacts in Arctic and Alpine systems. So there's a really big paper just published in Earth's Future um, which predicts the uh, loss of glaciers in UNESCO World Heritage Sites across the world. We can see here that there's two, uh, there's actually three climate change scenarios from the most pessimistic to the most optimistic, but on average, we're predicted to lose about 80% of ice cover across these amazing landscapes to the end of the century, and around 50% to the middle of the century. And I just want to use some more pop music now and some lyrics to help us reflect on that for a moment. And uh, we'll see some pictures from these amazing landscapes. Some of these pictures I took, some I didn't. Some I just nicked off Google images, so I hope that's okay. Use the translation. Don't think it's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Just so that we could appreciate the kind of things that we're losing here and, and our children are losing in the next 50 to 100 years. And uh, here's some science behind it. So uh, a big paper published in um, PNAS by some close colleagues of mine, my mentor, Sandy Milner, showing how we go when glaciers uh, are completely lost, how we go from this deterministic, predictable uh, regime, flow regime, so we know when we're going to have the water resources and we can plan our irrigation and our drinking water, etc., to where we've got very low or no glacier cover, where we've got this very unpredictable flow regime and we don't know when we're going to have water and when we're not. At the same time, George Monbiot and others, E.O. Wilson famously said, um, it's the little things that run the world. And George has been writing about this in The Guardian recently as well, about insectageddon, specifically with respect to agricultural landscapes. But um, we also hypothesized that uh, glacier loss would have an effect on insect diversity and functioning. So we looked across 363 streams that were draining glaciers across nine regions of the world. We went out and collected this data or used data from collaborators. These sites were distributed across a gradient of gl gl glacier cover from zero to 100%. We looked at over 1.2 million individual invertebrates samples. And we asked the question, what are the processes controlling the adaptation or the response of invertebrates, mostly insects, to glacial loss? And in each of those locations, we had networks of sites a bit like this that we went out to in Glacier Bay in Alaska. 
And at, we hypothesize that as glaciers are lost, so we're coming from right to left on this axis, we first lose cold adapted species, so specialists, then there'd be colonization of many more uh, species that are adapted to warmer conditions. So as we come across here, water temperatures are increasing, channel stability is increasing, and the amount of organic matter in the system is increasing. So we therefore also hypothesize that we'd see increasing species richness. And broadly speaking, we did see this, but we're also interested in what processes were behind this. So again, as we come down the glacier cover gradient, we hypothesize that the importance of the harsh habitat filters, so the very cold water, the unstable channel, and the low amount of organic matter would become less important, of course, as the conditions are ameli ameliorated. But that also, because as uh, systems lose glacier cover, they have more time for other species to colonize. So therefore, the importance of dispersal constraints, so species not being able to get to the site to establish a population there, would also decline. We we'll used basic ecological theory and wrap that up in computational statistical models. Um, I won't dwell on this too much because we're running out of time, but basically we expect to see different sets of species in very degraded environments compared to very pristine environments, and we use this idea in our models. We were also interested in the importance of dispersal, so we came up with um, probabilities of whether you'd find a species at a site of interest or not, depending on how close were, uh, that species was distributed throughout the river network, or for insects that can fly um, across the landscape. So we used those two ideas to quantify the relative importance of dispersal processes, habitat, and those two processes acting in concert. And we're just a reminder here of what we hypothesized. So we, we are seeing that the importance of that harsh habitat filter does decrease, but the effect is not very strong across any of our, I'm just showing four regions here. But what was surprising is that the importance of dispersal actually increased across the gradient. So our hypothesis was not right. And what this points to is that these communities are not fully adapting to climate change because the species that could have colonized that are suitable for the new conditions are not getting there because the landscape is fragmented. We're also seeing similar things uh, happening in response to other stresses such as soil erosion that ends up in our rivers and causes all kinds of problems. And Mo's been working on this during her PhD project. She's been looking at a bunch of sites across England. And I just picked out one graphic from her work that shows across this gradient of the impact essentially of soil erosion in rivers. This is a, what we call the turnover function. So this is telling us how quickly that is having an impact on the insect community. And you see, Almost all of the impact is at right at the beginning of that gradient, so just a little um, additional soil erosion input can have a big effect. So just to summarise, up to 80% of glacier ice volume is predicted to be lost by the end of the century. Insects are critical to ecosystem functioning, but we had little knowledge on the processes controlling their adaptation. Our meta-analysis showed firstly that cold adapted species were lost, so we're losing specialist species from the landscape. But there was incomplete colonization of species adapted to the new conditions. That was because dispersal was limiting their movement. And we're finding similar processes in the case of soil erosion and the knock-on effects in rivers. OK, we're coming towards the end. I just wanted to plug a seminar on the 20th of June that I think John's delivering just a little example of some of the work that I've been doing on Proteus, which is our new supercomputer. Uh, it's really revolutionized what I can do. I'm working with these huge, what we call phylogenetic trees that quantify back in time towards the center how related insect species are and other invertebrates. So let's come back to the species distribution modeling. And I'm sorry, Steve, I don't think yours worked for some reason. Every, every one I've tested this week worked but um, we can have a look at the other two. So this is what we did, and this is how we did it, a bit more detail. So this Global Biodiversity Information Facility has over a trillion records of species occurrences across the world. I've just plotted a map here of the records that are available in the database in 25 kilometer square grid cells, just for aquatic invertebrates. 
And you can see here, especially in the UK, we're very, very well served with data. So we should be making more of this. And that's what I've been trying to do in my work. We've been driving the models using data, um, world CLIM data, which is openly available GIS data, not the most robust uh, climate data. So it's something that we could work on together here at CORE. We could also work on adding land use change in here and other kind of soil um, uh, and other variables. But just very simply, essentially it's a regression in the background. And to represent climate change, I've just increased the mean annual temperature by two degrees and the seasonality or the variability of rainfall by 25%. So let's have a look at the results. So Chile, you're looking at the oyster catcher in Sky, and you said that you thought the impact of climate change might be very minimal. Okay, let's see. Okay, so here's your map. And here I've just flagged the location that we identified. You can see here that this is the probability of occurrence under the model. If we zoom in a bit, you can see that you've not done too bad with the location there. It's quite high up in there. So we've got a probability, sorry, it's a bit hard to see. The probability here is 76%. So we're more probable to find it than not in that location. The effect of climate change is positive. It's actually 24%. So that's going to take us up to 100%. So the oyster catcher is doing well under climate change, which is good news. It's, is it resilient? or Well, let's, let's not talk about that. And then, what was the common name of this species again, Barbara? Harebell. Okay. So actually, these harebells under the model, which is very crude, it looks like they're more sort of likely to be found in the, towards the north and west of the country. But this really is a very basic approach. But actually, when we zoom in, we can see some areas of high probability. Oh, so this is often what we find with plants. So you, you've got a probability of occurrence of 43%. And... Climate change is predicted to decrease that by 41%. So this is often what we find with plants. Plants are much more, uh, are often predicted to be much more impacted, negatively impacted by climate change. And that does raise questions about how we're doing the modelling for other species that rely on plants as resources and as habitat. Um, so there's something else we could work together on in Cori, which is building in species interactions, working with specialists on on particular species. So sorry Steve, I'll email you later, I'll, I'll work it out and I'll email it to you later. So to come back to synthesize then, I don't know how I'm doing for time, yeah, just about all right. Uh, everything I do is coloured by my history and our collective history, and that's why I kind of came up with this montage of the images that I've used. For me, objectivity in science is, is an aspiration to some. It's not my aspiration. I realise that it's highly subjective. There's subjectivity not in only how we study and what results we choose to emphasise, what interpretations we have of our results, but also in what we choose to study in the first place. What led me to my research themes, and if you were here at the start um, and you listened to the music and saw the lyrics, it will give you some idea. First of all, seeing the world, natural world as some kind of therapy, as an escape, so, and something to involve myself in, and we'll return to this idea in a moment. And my fascination with movement and migration and dispersal, and the, the song that I played right at the beginning as people were arriving is really about that. And a kind of juvenile angst that I have against the pr prevailing ideology of neoliberalism, and I, I mean juvenile in a really good way here, of this kind of instinctive feeling that something is wrong and you haven't necessarily got the words to articulate that. As I was preparing these slides over the last few days, a really close friend of mine reminded me of the words of Audre Lorde. She knew that I was working on this. Not Audre Lorde, my friend. And she sent me um, the essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury, going back to 1985. I just wanted to read this. I think it really sums up what, I, what I'm trying to say. 
So when we view living in the European mode only as a problem to be solved, we then rely solely upon our ideas to make us free, for these were what the White Fathers told us were precious. But as we become more in touch with our own ancient, black, non-European view of living as a situation to be experienced and interacted with, we learn more and more to cherish our feelings and to respect those hidden sources of power from where true knowledge and therefore lasting action comes. So I wouldn't agree completely with this because I don't think the idea of any knowledge being true or truer than another uh, really works for me. And I would also point out that she was talking about relying, we shouldn't rely solely upon our ideas. She wasn't denigrating the whole field of science completely. So to return to the question that I told you I wasn't going to be able to answer in the first place, what on earth do you mean resilient ecosystems? And what we really need to look at is what, what do we mean by the word resilience? And just to recap, what kind of resilience? Resilience of what, of what system, of what property of the system? With respect to what external change or pressure? Uh, through what mechanisms? And then what Audrey has reminded us is to think about how we feel about that in our research. And that's where I'll leave it. Questions? Thanks.